So, Cal, hi, welcome to freecapitalism.net. Thanks for being here. Thank you for the invitation over the seas. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. No, no problem at all. So, where, where are you at? I'm located in Richmond, Virginia, on the uh, eastern coast, so I guess Easter Standard Time. Oh, cool. Yeah, we had actually, uh, say some of the listeners, we had a couple of problems with the time, because actually the government controls the time. Right. Uh, which makes it particularly difficult to use. In the UK, just a couple of weeks ago, we had a uh, one hour change. They decided, the government decided to move the clocks back. And just to sort of demonstrate how, uh, with the times the government is, this has been, they've been doing this since sort of the 14th, 15th century when they did it to get, it was much easier for farmers because they could work during the daylight more if they moved the hour. But we haven't changed since then. Uh, a lot of things <laughs> haven't changed with government. And so, here in the United States, though, I recall, remember reading on that, I guess, some kind of corporate lobbyists were able to change the government to, you know, I guess the time in October to give it an extra hour uh, for Halloween, so that people have an extra hour for, I guess, the uh, candy companies to go out there collecting and um, and buying their their goods, I suppose. So yeah. central planning for the win, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Everything you want to influence is right there in DC to kind of, I guess, to, to corrupt that kind of influence to your favor. Yeah, exactly. So first question I want to ask you: um, I feel like we're a little bit Jeff Berwick right now because I'm drinking wine. Yeah. <laughs> First question I've got for you right now. What is, am I drinking? Uh, so how 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 did you become an anarchist? Uh oh yeah, I guess that is Jeff Burke style. Um, well, I mean, I guess that would be something I would ask of anyone I've ever met, someone new as well. I guess I'll ask the same of you. Um, I guess for me it was. Um, uh, well, I guess I guess in in the context of the childhood that I grew up with was very distrusting of people. Uh, I guess, you know, the universal rule to kind of keep yourself uh, safe from harm is to um, grant that everyone has the potential to hurt you, that they're lying to you, that they're uh, not on your side until proven otherwise. And, you know, that included uh, a lot of the adult relationships I had. So very mistrusting of people, which is, of course, a good thing to have in regards to government. So very always uh, mistrusting of government. But um, I guess the idea of anyone telling me what to do was not something I was keen about. And it wasn't until um, much later I met, uh, I guess when I was 18, I met um, a wonderful person, I guess one of the most important persons in my life. Her name is uh, Alina. And she introduced me, uh, I guess, some really great philosophical books like Crime and Punishment, um, I guess more in the realms of ethics, um, Anne Rand's uh, The Fountainhead. And that, I guess, kicked off my interest in uh, more philosophy, you know, Kantism. And leading up to, I guess, my, at the time, I guess I would have been an objectivist after that from um, until I moved here to Richmond. I moved here to Richmond, hanged out with a lot of um, anarcho-communists. Uh, I met a lot of them in D.C. I used to hang around InfoShop, so I was very familiar with uh, anarchism, very familiar with, I guess they would call themselves um, anarcho-socialists. But after a while of that kind of, um, hanging around that kind of culture, you know, finding the inconsistencies, um, led me to libertarian anarchism, and then uh, and then I, I found a lot more interesting, worthwhile information from there. I came across uh, some really cool, consistent stuff by Stefan Molyneux, and of course, you, even though I mean we have all this idea and the ideas are consistent, the ideas are rational, and you, you come to the non-aggression principle, but all of that seemed to me kind of useless if you can't communicate that to other people. Right. Um, if it's all stuck in here and you can't uh, share that with other people, then it's never going to go anywhere. And it becomes, um, you know, just one of those useless ideas you find in many of those books. It just doesn't come come about. Um, so the next uh, couple important people in my life when I, when I met here would be my um, two friends, uh, Sarah and Rachel. And it was with them having these conversations about anarchism over the course of several months that uh, they I guess it, they I guess we, we finally came to a better understanding. Um, we kind of. Uh, came up with the idea of um, eventually I guess, supporting the idea of uh, spreading this further around here in Richmond and uh, that's kind of what did it. Moving here to Richmond, finding people who were empathetic versus I guess the people I've met before I lived in Richmond and I think that uh, kind of empathetic community is kind of what drew me into realizing that people can be good. Uh, for the most part people have, people don't initiate force um, and that for the most part, they're, they're already for, for anarchy. They already practice anarchy. Uh, it's, it's that um, 
there's some um, areas of distraction uh, where we've all kind of been misled by the state and to kind of separate and to kind of see a little bit clearer through. Um, so that I would say that was my progressive journey all the way finally to free market anarchism um, from I guess from the start to to now. <laughs> so. Uh, I've seen a couple of your videos that, that came up and it, they, uh, a lot of them seem to be sort of you in public place, like talking to someone who's just sort of going about their daily life and says, oh, that's a, that's a cool sign. Those guys look cool. Let's go talk to them. They seem to come up and talk to you. Uh, you then seem to say some stuff that seems pretty, to me at least, <laughs> it seems like common sense stuff. Like you'll say um, something along the lines of, do you use violence to solve problems? And they're like, well, of course not. And then you say, do you vote? And they're like, well, of course I do, right? And um, that that is actually um, quite uh, powerful, I think, the way that uh, you explain all of this stuff. And I'm inter interested to know, what, what sort of success have you seen with this? Because I, I've got to say, I think you're one, one of the quickest speaking, but also one of the quickest um, at reacting to arguments uh, <laughs> I've, ever, I've ever seen. So like, tell, tell me how some successful you've you sort of been with that i guess my if i have a weakness is a weakness uh to engage in uh argumentation uh and debates uh to, to talk to have a discussion uh, especially in, about philosophy and i would say um i, I just I, I guess I, I found that the realm of a lot of these discussions take place online and when you're having these these discussions online uh it kind of misses the point of human connection human um interaction communication most of communication is nonverbal, so you're missing about 90 percent of the important cues that the other person needs and that feedback to better understand what uh what you're talking about um if you're doing it behind a computer screen there's a lot of i guess variables that are missing that of course lends to a lot of uh, back and forth um, infighting and that can last for days um so i found uh it to always be efficient to just talk to people in person i've never been one to like have long conversations online anyways or texting or phone call conversations especially if they live in the same city you know we can do it faster efficiently quicker if he's just talk in person about these uh, th these issues um and so after Carefully uh, creating a method of rhetoric, the, the three questions, and then following up to to introduce anarchism. I found that you know before you have any discussion, before like you have a boxing match, you know you you're, you define what the rules are. You know, so before we have a discussion on um, on anarchy, let's define these the terms, right? Let's define what is violence, um, because for the most part, people have a lot of different um, definitions and ideas and that are very um, overreaching that can involve everything as violence, owning property as violence, for example, uh, they will say. And so first off, to kind of define these terms. Now, before we go to the discussion, let's define what the rules are, the parameters. Um, I don't know, I'm not gonna presuppose what your moral positions are, so I set up the three questions to, to find out. And of course, I've, um, ex with the exception of maybe one communist, uh, I've met uh, pretty much everyone and ish agrees that um, they don't use violence, they don't initiate uh, force onto other people. You know, they don't uh, rape, murder, theft, and assault, uh, these areas that include violations of property rights. They also agree that the self-defense is justifiable, but, but the initiation of violence is wrong. Uh, and that they don't use violence in their everyday life to solve problems, and that it's also wrong and immoral to violently force your ideas onto other people. Um, and so they, they themselves reveal their positions um, after asking those questions. And which is great because that tells me then that they already have a good moral integrity starting point against the initiation of force. And then it becomes easier to paint the brush of what, um, I guess, the matrix looks like around us, you know, to kind of carry on objectively what is government and how government is the initiation of force, how it's even founded through the initiation of force, and that the only way government knows how to solve problems is through that one singular solution, the initiation of force, violence, versus though the plurality of nonviolent solutions that you and I already share. So I would say that the videos that I do record are more of an um, anthropological study. Uh, I guess they're my, um, the evidence I need to, to, I guess, to continue showing myself that you know, people are ready for this, that uh, people uh, for the most part don't use violence and that's really what anarchism is, is about finding voluntary and consensual solutions um so then afterwards finally we can get to the to the discussion what about the roads what about security what about uh you know all these other questions that sometimes are difficult to answer straightforward without setting up the pretext the context um to those areas of thought 
Um, and I found uh, the conversation to be a lot easier, <laughs> a lot more fun, a lot more enjoyable, a lot more enlightening for, for both parties involved. Um, I enjoy it. I have a lot of fun with it. And after that, it's, uh, I know it shouldn't be that difficult. I, I haven't found it that, that difficult. I mean, we've, I've made dozens and dozens of friends, free market anarchist friends now, just going out there, um, just talking to people. And uh, of course, there's um, some people sometimes who get stuck on, on the idea, but you know, that's uh, why I continue going out there. If you have more questions, you know, I'm not that hard to find. <laughs> I'm not that hard to miss. Um, so yeah, I found it, I guess, the measure of success and uh, using that, uh, uh, I guess, the, that particular method of uh, rhetoric to, to be quite fruitful. Um, I guess if, if all I received, if I went out there like, you know, fuck you, get the hell out of here, you know, um, and, and that was consistently the kinds of responses and feedback I received, then I would say, okay, you know what, after a month by that, you're right, you know, I guess the world's not ready for peace, they're not ready for, uh, you know, voluntary solutions, you know, um, you know, I guess uh, I'd be, uh, I guess, one of the many lone and cap wolves out there um, without a tribe, without a community, I guess. Um, yeah. Well, so I mean, that, that sounds great. I, I think uh, I think your videos perhaps will be watched back in 100 years' time. <laughs> <laughs> this is how people thought, perhaps. This is how they dressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, yeah. um, but, I mean, this all sounds, well, this all sounds very well, but, I mean, who's going who's gonna to build the roads? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, non-violence all sounds very good in practice, but, how, how, you know, how are we going to build roads? So, what, what were you going to say to someone like that? Um, so, a, a lot of these questions comes from, um, I guess, economic literacy, either from not having a good understanding of how entrepreneurship works. Uh, and they don't teach you that in public schoolings. They don't teach you contracts. They don't teach you negotiation skills. They don't teach you entrepreneurship, how to be independent, how to be financially stable, how to live a fun, fulfilling life. Uh, they need you to be to, to, have, to lack these skills so that way you're dependent on the government to provide these services. Um, because any entrepreneur will tell you, like, look, I, there's a there's a market out there. There's a demand. Um, you know, anyone can start a business. The only thing that differentiates you and, and the other coffee shops around here is is how you market yourself, how you present your ideas, and same thing with roads. Same thing with any product or commodity, any any uh, service or good that's uh, that people desire. You know, to help uh, fulfill their needs. And so, for the most part, it's interesting because. Um, Roads are already built by businesses to begin with. You know, they're outsourced to uh, businesses and bidding contracts. You know, the government doesn't build anything. They they outsource to the politically connected, to the lowest bidder, um, in which you yourself have no economic freedom in choosing who's the, who's the better road builder provider. Um, you know, to look back in their background history, are they able? To, you know, do they always fill the potholes on time? Uh, why, why do they continue to do all this road work during the day when there's high volumes of traffic instead of at night? I mean, like, not many people are on the roads, you know, that's a government decision. Those are government policies in place that are kind of dictating that and making everyone's life, um, I guess, taking that much longer to, I guess, reach their destination. Um, you know, every minute that, uh, that you're out there stuck in traffic, you could thank government for stealing a moment of your life. And those moments do add up. Um, you know, so the answer for the roads is very, are, is very easy. You know, pe people will build the roads, businesses will build the roads. Um, but you'll have direct access, consumer to to that uh, particular business and remove the middleman, uh, the extortionist from, who steals from you and calls you that you are an incompetent human being that can't make economic decisions. And that's what government is telling you, that you're not a competent human being, that you're not an immature adult who can make economic decisions. Um, and they'll do it on your behalf, you know, altruistically. Um, so that's, um, and then roads were long privatized, of course, before government started to monopolize them um, around here in the United States. So. Yeah, people will build the roads if there's a market for that, and then let's you know the competition will create the cost of those roads uh, to be to to be lowered and the quality to improve. Um, and you find that uh, removing the government monotonous tone underlying the, the way that they create stuff, the inefficiency that they go about it, you know, you'll find rich and diverse ways to kind of travel by then. You know, uh, like in Detroit, for example. So. Uh, mass transit has shut down in Detroit. Uh, the government unfunded liabilities have collapsed. Uh, the, the government, um, I guess, monopolies there. And so there is this uh, ingenious 25-year-old entrepreneur who bought these four buses, painted these buses to reflect the geographic regions of Detroit. And these buses will pick you up wherever you are. Call them, text them. Um, there's no centralized political planning routes. And there's also, because the, the monopoly of law is difficult to enforce, there's also music on these buses, there's Wi-Fi on these buses, there's BYOB 
on these buses. Um, so I mean, th these are like one, one interesting solution out there, you know, that, that could very much and en I guess enrich the way that we live our, our life, you know, the way that we travel. It doesn't have to be the way it, it exists today. Uh, the, the monotonous, the boring, the potholes, the traffic, um, you know, dangerously so. Many people die on these particular state-maintained roads. So I would say that um, it's, it, I, I would find it only troublesome if the person were to ask who would build the roads and they themselves were a business owner, right? It's like, well, if you call yourself a business owner, you know, you shouldn't be asking who would build the roads, you know, if you are also providing a good or service yourself, right? Someone entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially like, like yourself, right? Um, and that's kind of what we need today. Um, more people to take that innovative risk to, to create the markets of tomorrow. Yeah, this is, this is true. And, um, uh... Uh, well, in terms of BYOB, I'm guessing you mean bring your own beer, right? That's what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> system, of, system of a down is bring your own bomb, right? <laughs> I might, have might have to edit that out. But uh, bring, well, that's funny because in the UK, um, it, you're, you're not allowed to drink on a lot of trains, for example, in London. Right. And so because that's the law, people drink on purpose um, in the trains. And this is widespread. This is this could be socialists. This could be all kinds of people who are very pro-state who will actually drink on purpose on the train just because it's the law not to do that. Um, and I think that's actually the case with a lot of things. It's such a shame. It's such a shame that the the sort of origins of a lot of culture that exists in Northern Europe and in the United States is very much the sort of Anglo-Saxon uh, sort of wasp culture, which is I work hard and I follow the rules. And yet, I think this is actually changing, um, that people are actually making the effort not to follow rules on purpose at times. Um, and I don't know if you've seen that at all in your own sort of interactions. Well, what's your opinion on sort of the change of culture in the last, like, 50 years? Uh, I would say it's gotten a lot more docile, um, a lot more state of inertia. It's... Um, the government has done a very good job in pacifying, uh, I guess, the, the resistance to these particular um, <laughs> slave laws. Uh, and of course, if, if you do it over time, gradually, um, you know, the next generation that are born, you know, won't notice a difference. Um, and of course, if you fill their, uh, their young minds as if uh, like it was always been this way, kind of like in 1984, you know, always revising history, like the um, United States has always been at war, and um, it's difficult for them to notice the difference then between uh, freedom and slavery. And so I find uh, that to be quite an alarming, um, I guess, bit of the culture that exists today. I mean, you look at Europe, whenever there's uh, some kind of uh, outrageous uh, governmental demand, you know, people are overturning buses, uh, people are, are rioting, people are protesting, people are challenging government, um, they're police extortionists. Here in the United States, it's, um, and you look at the Boston Marathon, for example, there was a bombing there and, and they allow a, a police state to just come and roll in. Um, not that I'm advocating, you know, violent, forceful resistance or anything of that matter, but I think it's uh, the direction of how they are look about activism has um, been misdirected into, you know, just don't say anything. Um, it's uh, the government has done a good job redirecting that, I guess, that outlet of frustration towards perhaps distractions on television, trying to. Uh, create these uh, outlets that go of activism that goes nowhere, uh, trying to find uh, band-aid solutions instead of uh, looking at the cause and the cause of all the turmoil, the um, human suffering is, is, has always been the state. So I think government has done a good job over the number of years creating these distractions. Um, you know, you look back in the 60s when people saw the bodies of war coming from Korea and Vietnam and people were very much visibly upset. Uh, about these uh, about these wars, but now you know you hide the bodies, you hide the violence, you make you you distract people from that um, from from the reality, and uh, if people can't see it, you know there's nothing for people I guess to visually become upset or angry about. Um, so I would say the United States, uh, I guess in comparison to the rest of the other governments, have, has done a very good job in pulling the wool over many people's eyes of uh, of seeing that, and um, so I, I find that to be very troublesome 
I guess uh, to tell you the truth. Um, so, so where do you see where do you see the Lipsy movement going? And what is what is the Lipsy movement as well? <laughs> well, I I don't know um, what the Liberty movement is. Um, I guess my main focus of, of attention is here in Richmond. Um, there, for me, there's only Richmond. Uh, for me, I, I can't make. Um, I'm, I'm concerned about what goes on in the rest of the world and other cities, of course. But for me, it's uh, if I'm going to create that kind of change and that kind of impact, I have to have to do it here at home. Um, not, uh, I guess, going around and having myself distracted from my, my focus. You know, if I can't, people talk about changing the world, changing the, the country. It's like, well, you can't even change, um, I guess, some of the cultural perceptions of, and these ideas in your own city. Now, what chance do you have, right? If you can't even talk to your, your parents and your best friends about anarchy, you know, what, what chance do you have about, you know, reaching out to strangers, reaching out to, to <laughs> I guess, other outlets of uh, media attention? Um, so I, I focus my, I guess my movement is, um, th that I share with many other of my friends here, uh, is in Richmond. And, uh, so I, I could say, I guess the state of that is, uh, very good. <laughs> um, we have monthly freedom gatherings. I'm about to be leaving very soon to a, uh, another gathering. We call it drinking philosophy. Uh, you know, they have dollar margaritas, uh, no, three dollar margaritas, dollar tacos, uh, with a lot of people who share the love of wisdom and, um, meeting new friends. Um, so my, my attention and focus is here, and uh, RVA is an abbreviation for Richmond. And I would say the measure of effects, we have over 70 members, kind of, and uh, kind of growing off from, from there after nearly two years, I guess two years would be next month after doing this. And that's, um, I don't know, that's, I find that to be all I need, I guess, in terms of uh, knowing that we're on the right track and this continues to grow, and that's the direction where we have to keep heading, you know, stay the course. Um, and of course, once you unplug yourself from the matrix, you see what the, um, the illusion of the state that, that it is and that is full of violence. You know, you can't turn your back against that. You can't pretend that, that doesn't exist, which is a much better position to let go of politics because in politics, in the realm of that area, uh, it's like uh, football teams. You know, it's like, well, uh, this candidate didn't win, so maybe I should go for that candidate. You know, well, maybe I'll let go of the Democrats, you know, as the independents say, and go, you know, Republican. Um, the Libertarian Party here, you know, uh, for example, they started in 1971. They've had four decades uh, to, to show a measure of success. Uh, they had a Libertarian candidate named Sarvis. He's garnered 6% support this last uh, le election. And for me, it's like 6%. That's not after after 40 years. You know, that's that's not a measure of success. You know, I will sooner die a tax slave, you know, still waiting, waiting in for um, for some kind, polite political ruler to to, I guess, um, to, to release these chains um, instead of uh, seeking that freedom out yourself, um, you know, to, I guess, to put the individual again once over the the collective idea of politics. Um, so I would say the movement that I'm, I'm involved in. Um, yeah, it's it's going well. Uh, I'm not so, sure about say to you, so there's people in for example Europe right now I'm well it depends who you ask some people say Britain is in Europe some people don't um, that uh, the best way to approach achieving freedom is to go for the government to go for the biggest mafia in the <laughs> area. it seems it seems to me that your solution is quite different from that your solution is like grassroots it's like building it up from the bottom to to the top, which I know is a, actually a lot of other people's strategies. Um, and just relating to what you were saying about politics, well, I think politics is very much Hollywood for ugly people. Um, if you look at the sort of people who uh, exist in politics, you can tell that they, for example, would never survive in Hollywood, but also uh, they, they have this certain uh, feeling well, I certainly get a, a certain feeling from politicians when I meet them, or people who are prospective politicians. Um, so, get, to, tell me what your opinion is. Do you think the best way to achieve liberty is if we have grassroots sort of movements in a lot of different places, but also um, we look at politics as so? Yeah. What, what's your reaction to politicians? What's your reaction to people who pursue politics? Who you actually meet? Like, what is your feeling? <laughs> well, um, I, I guess I guess there's two ways to look at it. One would be uh, that you know there's no measure of success that that works. You know, the fact that you're still a slave today 
uh, implies that all the past hundreds and thousands of years to achieve freedom through politics have failed. Right? If, if they were to work, they would have worked by then through all the different measures and means that many people have provided and attempted to to harness and tame the beast that is the Leviathan. Um, and the fact that you're still born a slave, that you're still a slave today, and your offspring most likely will continue to be slaves, uh, means that it's failed. And so that's uh, several thousand years of evidence against that idea that, uh, you know, still hitting your head against the, the idea of a politics that, that, that like, like that's an original thought. Um, and at the same time, you know, you look at, uh, I guess, people here cheering for the legalization of cannabis, for example. Look, look, 75 years to finally gain the freedom to smoke a plant is not a measure of success. To, to gain one freedom and lose so many of others at the same time, it's not a measure of success. Um, and at the same time, of course, if you look at it objectively in terms of how they still cry out for politicians it's like well you know that's interesting you know if, if you like to have a a ruler a political master that's 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 all well um don't force your kinky preferences onto other people you know if you enjoy being a sub being a slave enjoy having that master slave relationship you know that's that sounds very um i guess wildly entertaining but you know keep that to yourself in your own room and your own you know make sure you have a safe word um don't go about ask uh, forcing your kiki um master and sub slave relationship on other people i right? know that seems what people are crying out for when they talk for um that they have a desire to for politicians right i've had one person once ask well why don't you run as a politician that's like look i'm you know no offense, I don't find you attractive. I have no interest in being your, I guess, sex slave master or anything that, that matter. Um, you know, it's not going to work with us. You know, go, you know, maybe someone else that could work out for you. But, uh, you know, make sure there's a safe word involved with that because when it deals with the state, you know, there's no safe word involved in, in the way that they initiate force. So um, I think maybe perhaps is a, a frustrating outlet that people have in, frust in uh, re revealing their sexual frustrations that they, they need, they want to master. Uh, that chain and bond is that's fantastic, you know, as long as it's voluntary and consensual um, Just don't force your BDSM preferences on on everyone else Yeah, great. I uh, we, we, We've got a short time left. So I'm gonna say if you had 60 seconds Sorry, I'll give you 120 seconds to convince a minicus How uh, to become an ANCAP and you just had that 120 seconds and they've just approached you in Virginia and they said, "Okay, yeah, I don't believe in welfare. I don't believe in any of this this stuff. But we need we need a government for defence. If if we didn't have a government to at least step in when things go bad, it would be complete chaos." <laughs> do, you, do you reckon we we'll do that in 120 seconds? Um, well, I'll do something better. Uh, for anyone who's who finds himself faced with the situation with a minarchist or or a communist, um, don't. Put too much stock in that conversation uh, and I'll be honest um, I'd, I'd rather talk to a socialist I'd rather talk to a Democrat uh, a Republican than uh, someone who's a libertarian with a capital L um, I found uh, the conversations with these with those particular small groups of people like I'd rather talk to someone who's never heard of Ron Paul or has never uh, read the Communist Manifesto someone who's not a Marxist or a minarchist and I found that uh, the conversation goes a lot better, um, I guess, in terms of, of in dialogue and understanding and accepting free market anarchism. Um, with um, anarchists, uh, you know, people forget, I mean, people talk about pop political solutions, especially libertarians. Um, and they say like, well, the difference between a libertarian, a minarchist, and an anarchist is um, what six months or two years. But they don't reveal to you that actually uh, their prior political positions, as was maybe perhaps once a Democrat or Republican, and that takes like 10, 12 years uh, before you finally understand, come to about to uh, what libertarianism is, and then that's an additional few more years. So that's like uh, 12 to 15 years, you know, in that time span being stuck. And I find uh, minarchism, I uh, guess, going about through it politically. Is a pothole on, on the road to freedom. It's uh, and it's not um, something I find conducive. People get stuck in that quicksand area of philosophy for for quite a long time. Um, versus someone who's never heard of free market anarchism, who's because I guess minarchism just stops short of that. Stops short of integrity. They stop short of consistency. And for whatever I don't know, projective reasons that they're they're holding on to that. It's like I, I can't help you. Um, I'd rather talk to someone else who's who's never heard of these particular principles and areas that you've already revealed yourself that you to do know as a minarchist, but they have like a sort hang up on like defense 
uh, for some reason. Um, you know, the night watchman uh, argument. But, um, you know, that's still a socialist position. You know, they're against socialized health care. They're against socialized uh, welfare. But they're not. Uh, but everything about socialized defense is okay. Right? Inconsistent. Lack of integrity. Um, you know, shows a lack of courage to go all the way. So I'd rather talk to, for anyone who comes about that, I guess, interaction, just this don't put much stock in that conversation. In time, perhaps they'll, they'll come to a realization and they'll finally have the courage to step up and go all the way with that consistency. But um, there's there's a market of, that of um, pretty much 90, 90, over 90% of the population that are not minarchists or communists. You know, let's let's talk with th to those people. You know, that's the market I want to reach. Um, you'll have much better chance and a much better uh, measure of success and uh, having a fruitful discussion about free market anarchism than you will with a minarchist. Um, so yeah, with the minarchists, um, you know, I, I'll still I'll still continue talking with them, but my focus and direction will be, you know, hopefully one day you let go of the idea that violence will set us free. Um, if you have any more questions, you know where to find me. But I'm going to go talk to someone else who's a lot more interested in actually going all the way, going across the finish line, and ending the state for once and, and, and for all. Um, so if, if you had a, if you had to put a hundred bucks on where we would be in a hundred years' time. We'll either be in a tyrannical uh, prison <laughs> or we will be in a stateless society. Uh, Where would you put that 100 bucks? Freedom. I'll, I'll, I'd put my uh, 100 bitcoins on freedom. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's like $100 billion. <laughs> <laughs> and by then, there'll probably be like future Rama coins or something. But um, yeah, I, I, I want freedom in my lifetime. I'm not going to stop until you know that's, that's accomplished. Um, you know, for me and my, my friends and my family and those I care and, and um, hold about dearly, um, you know, this is, a, I guess, a lifelong mission, but I do, um, I guess that's where I'm set up against. Um, and I don't want my, my children to be born with social security prison tattoo numbers on, on their little feet. So that's um, something that I know can end. I've, I've already um, met a lot of free market anarchists here in Richmond that didn't have to move to my city. They didn't have to move far away to meet all their anarchists. And they're, they're around you. You know, there's every person you meet, every person out there in your own city is a potential free market anarchist. You just have to go out there and and then um, go to bat against the state, against their the hole that the matrix has and um, help, help free each other. Um, you know, help use the bold colors of philosophy to to end that the violence hold of and grip of the state. Great. Well, if you could uh, tell our subscribers like where to find you, where they can find um, your videos, and perhaps you put a website or anything like that, um, please please tell them now. Uh, okay. All right. So, well, uh, we have a website called W. Well, it's on. Um, of course, everything's W W. Uh, it's liberatervra.com. Um, again, RVA stands for Richmond, Virginia. Uh, you can find my YouTube channel under my uh, my name, Cal Malone. Uh, I guess abbreviated Renegade Boy Scout. And uh, yeah, we, we do a lot of uh, videos. We do a lot of uh, outreach activism. Um, if you're ever in town, <laughs> if any free market anarchists are out there, um, you have a place to stay. We have, uh, we have uh, I guess, two houses here. They're called Anarchy Gardens. In which uh, fellow anarchist travelers, you know, who are passing through, or would like to, you know, see the sights here in Richmond. Uh, contact us. Let us know. Um, you know, we have, uh, I guess, a haven here for for all the non-aggression principle lists. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, that's uh, something that we all kind of have to work together and, and strive to. You know, it's um, I, I want freedom in my lifetime. I, this is not um, something I see. I guess uh, taking a break from or kind of relinquishing to, I guess, the narrative of the state that they want you to give up. They want you to become inert. They want you to be distracted and they want you to give up. But um, and that's something that uh, you can't do once you, you have that truth. Um, so yeah, that's uh, something that I, I want. And I'm sure all of you are watching one or two. And so, you know, let's continue working strong together and, and ending the state and having real freedom in our lifetime. Great. Well, thank you very much. No, thank you.